This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy studio in Burlington, Vermont, bringing you our ongoing nuclear free future conversation. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, let's welcome our, our guest today, Arnie Gunderson, Chief Engineer from Fairwinds Energy Education. Thank you. Welcome back oh, again, thank Arnie. You. <coughs> I'm so glad to see you again, even though you always bring us disturbing information about what's going on in the nuclear power uh, world. The name of our, the title for our show is Nuclear Power, Who is Looking Out for the Public? So from the top, Arnie, let's start with Vermont Yankee and what the problem for the public is there. Yeah. Well, we could have a 12-hour show on who's looking out for the public, but we'll yeah. get it to half an hour. The, um, at Vermont Yankee, the, uh, um, the plant is decommissioned. It, it's shut down and being dismantled. Um, but the dismantlement will take years. And in the meantime, the state of Vermont has been very active. And my hat's off to uh, uh, Chris Recchia, who's the head of the, uh, um, the Public Service uh, Board there, Public Service Commission. And um, he's been aggressively maintaining that uh, we, he's looking out for Vermonters. So it's not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It's not the owner of Vermont Yankee Energy. But the, uh, the state of Vermont is trying as hard as it can against insurmountable odds to, uh, to look out for Vermonters. In, in what way? Is this about cleaning up the site? Or because the last time you were on Nuclear Free Future, uh, you, it was just at the closing of Vermont Yankee. That was January 1st of this year, right? Mm -hmm. 2015. So what is, what is happening now? Or do they start the cleanup? Or? Well, they've taken about $70 million out of the decommissioning fund. And there's really nothing to show for it. The, the, all of the radioactivity is still there. Uh, but they're allowed to take this money out to plan. So they're doing a lot of planning. Uh, actually, Entergy's made more money since the plant's been shut down than when it was running because the planning is being done by an Entergy subsidiary. So um, uh, they're making a profit on the engineering hours when the plant was itself was unprofitable. So it's a, it's a moneymaker again for Entergy. And how does the NRC fit into this picture of Vermont Yankee at this moment in time? You know, that's really the key piece in this. Yeah. When Vermont Yankee was bought by Entergy, nobody thought about what would happen. And um, nobody thought about how um, uh, when the plant shuts down, who's going to be monitoring? Back in the day before that, we had a utility-owned power plant, and the Public Service Commission could look at the process. But when we sold it to Entergy, we lost the ability to audit where that money's being spent. And we, we lost the ability to control the emergency plan, for instance. The emergency plan is um, um, still in effect right now, but very shortly will end. And yet, at the very top of Vermont Yankee is the nuclear fuel pool. And in it is the equivalent of 700 bomb, bombs worth of cesium. And until that nuclear fuel pool is emptied and brought down on the ground, and that's five years out, until that happens, my position and the state's position is that Vermont Yankee is still very dangerous. And uh, we need an emergency plan until we get that fuel out of the fuel pool. And what, what is comprised in the emergency plan? Is this evacuation of people around the, the power plant? Yes, it's maintaining the uh, sirens. It's maintaining the network of people that are called upon, the phone systems. There's a center for the uh, emergency plan that people would go to in the event of an emergency. So it's maintaining all of that infrastructure and drilling to make sure that an accident doesn't happen. And we, we seem to forget that Vermont Yankee had an, uh, a near miss back in 2008 when um, the nuclear fuel pool was here and they were lifting nuclear fuel out with a very heavy crane. The brakes failed. Mm. And <clears throat> it began to drop um, without, uh, without human assistance. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission seems to forget that brakes can fail and that if that were to happen in the next five years, um, Vermont would be in serious trouble. Take us back to that 2008 incident where the brakes failed and then the emergency uh, mechanism kicked in, right? Um, no. Uh, what happened was the, um, the brake 
failed, like in a car though, they didn't completely fail. It just slowly, slowly, slowly went down and down and down, and they couldn't stop it mm -hmm. until it got to the got to the floor. Um, and th that's the nearest one of these heavy cranes has come. That the, the canister that carries this radioactive fuel is very highly shielded, and empty it weighs 70 tons, and full with the nuclear fuel it weighs 100 tons. So what did Entergy do when they were testing the brake? They um, tested it for 70 tons, mm -hmm. but they never tested it for 100 tons. And what happened was that extra 30 tons of weight was enough to cause the brake to fail and the container to, uh, uh, to fall. Um, so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does want to address that there's a huge risk until we've got that fuel down on the ground. And Vermont Yankees really unique too in that there's a school right across the street. And one of the things I've been saying is that it, when you have to move the fuel, there's no doubt it's important to get the fuel off the roof, but when you do that, make sure the school isn't in session because it's just one more risk. Let's get those um, 500, 600 kids out of there in case something goes wrong. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't want to hear about that either. And you're saying that these emergency standards and mechanisms will be out of, out of uh, operation at a certain time. Right. The emergency plan is in effect now, but uh, essentially the Entergy plans to do away with it in, in uh, less than a year. Um, and the fuel is still there for another three or four years after that. So the, the problem becomes, what do we do in the next four years if there is an emergency at Vermont Yankee? The plans and the, the phone lines and all that kind of stuff has been uh, eliminated. And um, there's nobody watching the store. There's nobody here to protect us. But where does the state of Vermont come in and the state of Vermont's responsibility for the people of Vermont? Like our, our topic is who is looking out for the public? So who is looking out for the public in this instance? Yeah, well, Chris Recchia has been very active in uh, uh, trying to get Entergy to keep the emergency plan in place. And Entergy doesn't want to spend that money. Um, so they would, they would rather risk our lives than spend the money on maintaining a plan until the fuel is off the, off the, the roof. And I don't think that's fair. I, I think that Vermonters gave them that money. It was money that we contributed for years. And for, um, for Entergy to now tell us how they plan to spend it, and it's not on our public health and safety, um, uh, that's, a, that's a concern. Arnie, what do you what do you project will happen at the at this time when when the emergency plan isn't isn't in operation? Well, I hope that other states will become involved because Vermont and Yankee is not the only plant that's like this. It's not the only what we call a merchant plant. It's not owned by a utility, but there's 40 others like that, and hopefully. Um, Doug Hoffer, who's the auditor, and uh, Chris Recchia, who runs the Public Service Com Board Commission, um, will will put pressure on the other states to put pressure on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Nobody thought of this back 10 and 15 years ago when these plants were being spun off. Um, but now that they're approaching the end of life, um, we really need to address watching the fund which is a state auditor role, and watching the public safety, which is the, uh, the Public Service Commission. And the st the, so the state of Vermont is responsible for the, people, the people's safety in Vermont? At the end of the day, it's the governor and the administration that's responsible. You know, if, if things go to hell at Vermont Yankee, we're not going to drive to Louisiana to interview the head of Entergy. Right. We're going to drive to Montpelier and interview Peter Shumlin. So at the end of the day, the, the buck stops with the governor and his appointee, which is Chris Recchia. And at the same time, they are the oversight body is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is a, a federal agency, right? Yes. And there, well, you have told me before on this program that they have oversight over the nuclear power plants, but at the same time, their job is to sell the nuclear power business. They, they claim to have oversight on nuclear power, but, you know, uh, Maggie and I at Fairwinds, we put together a huge report, 45-page report, on the problems with decommissioning in February. 
and they allowed me six minutes to present the report to them, and they sat there like stones in, in the That's process. That's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Commission, yes, in Brattleboro. But they got this report, and they haven't done a thing with it now in half a year. But the nuclear industry wants to relax the nuclear decommissioning standards, and they approached the NRC back in April, then they've already had a hearing, and they're already moving down the process of relaxing the standards. So it's not an agency that's an honest broker, it's just not. And who, in your opinion, who is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission accountable to? Are they accountable to the people or to the nuclear power industry, in fact? Well, yeah, in, in, uh, the papers say that they are a regulator responsible for safety, but well, there's five commissioners, and they're all appointed by Congress, and everyone, once a year, for five years, and each one gets the approval of the Nuclear Energy Institute, the lobbying arm, before they take the job. Mm -hmm. So here we are, uh, the five people responsible for looking at Ver Vermont Yankee and the other 100 nuclear plants are essentially approved by the nuclear industry. You won't find someone like, uh, like me, for instance, or Dave Lockbaum, a union concerned scientist, in that oversight role. Right. Now, it seems that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, is very much on board of, uh, of lowering the standards for nuclear power plants. For instance, they, they are closing uh, the study on cancer statistics around nuclear power plants. That's one of the saddest things that happened this year. There was a, a program with the, the uh, National Academy of Science yeah. and, and other scientists to look at cancer st statistics at, around nuclear power plants. And it's been done in Germany and the results were awful. Uh, that there is an increase in cancer surrounding the nuclear power plants in Germany. Well, the NRC was gonna do the same thing here. And just two weeks ago, they canceled it. And they said, well, with budget constraints, we didn't want to spend the money. So their position is, uh, it's frightening because I wonder what was in the data that was coming in, uh, but they didn't want to spend the money. But at the same time, they're entertaining a petition with um, a, a, a group of scientists have approached them with something called hormesis. And what it means is that radiation is good for you. And a, a more radiation is okay. As a matter of fact, it improves you because the the, the mutations are a positive factor in your life. So oh, they're, they're this, out there. This is, hormesis is, is a study from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? Horm hormesis is a theory um, presented by rogue scientists. Um, the the, the uh, National Academy of Science does not support it. Um, there's a report called BEER, B-E-I-R-7, and it says, no, hormesis is not, uh, is, is, is not a real phenomenon. But yet these rogue scientists are saying, uh, a little radiation is good for you. Here, have a little bit yes. more. And uh, so what they're trying to do is raise the standards that you and I are subjected to. And at the same time, they're refusing to analyze the exposure of people around nukes. They're seriously considering a rulemaking hearing raising the radiation standards. Now, Arnie, back in, in several years ago, uh, you, uh, you, you and Maggie Gunderson, your wife and, and the found, one of the founders, of, you two are the founders of Fairwinds Energy Education, and you, you were telling us how the, uh, the radiation around the school uh, at, down at, at Vermont, in Vernon, in, in, by Vermont Yankee, how they were lowering these standards for radiation around the school. Isn't that so? So this is something that has been going on for forever. Yes. Yeah. You know, the, the, um, the, the Vermont Yankee is unique in that it's, it has this school literally right across the street, yeah. uh, 4,000 feet away from the, from the nuclear reactor. And um, what happens uh, during refueling outages is that uh, tritium, which is a radioactive liquid water, uh, boils off from the nuclear fuel pool and goes out the stack and deposits in the neighborhood, including on the roof of the school, including on the playground and all that kind of stuff. So that for the 43 years Vermont Yankee was running, it's been constantly depositing radioactive tritium on the, on the ballparks and on the roofs of the, of the buildings in the vicinity. Um, and yet no one at the NRC 
has ever measured that. It's a phenomenon. It's actually called rain out. You know, if you think about it, it goes up with the ventilation and mixes with the river fog and then settles down and on your windows, on your car, on the grass, on the roof of the buildings, and it's tritiated water uh, that winds up on the roof of that school. It's sad. This is, it, it is terrible, and no, nobody from the NRC has measured it, and yet at the same time, two weeks ago, they're lowering the, uh, the amount of, uh, of radiation that is, is uh, good for us. And they're saying at the same time that radiation yeah. is well, good for us. Well, they're actually raising the amount raising, that's Raising, I'm us. sorry, yeah. raising yeah. the amount. And it yeah. comes from Fukushima. What happened to Fukushima was that uh, the number was 100 millirem that you and I could receive from a nuclear plant. And uh, when the accident happened, oh my gosh, there was probably out to 50 miles uh, the 100 millirem number would, uh, uh, wouldn't hold. So what the Japanese did, they said the new number is 2,000. They raised the safe threshold 20-fold, and that allowed them not to evacuate as many people. Right. So they've, the, the Japanese evacuated 180,000. About 60,000 have come back to their homes. And um, the problem is that, um, well, they just had this huge um, uh, typhoon over there called A2, um, E-T-A-U, I think, A-T-A-U. And the, um, they were on record as saying that our power plant had a leak, um, one of the pumps didn't work, and some water, radioactive water, entered the Pacific. And they have, they've been collecting garbage bags full of radioactive soil. And right now there's something on the order of 30 million garbage bags in about 100,000 locations throughout Fukushima, where, where people have gone out and collected radioactive soil and put it in the garbage bags. And about 300 of those washed out during the storm as well. That's all Tokyo Electric is focusing on. But they haven't cleaned up 90% of the state, the prefecture of Fukushima. And this colossal rain that they've had has washed all of that down into the villages that were previously clean and then down into the streams and back out into the Pacific. So they have the press focused on these little problems at Fukushima. Meanwhile, the entire state of Fukushima Prefecture is leaking like a sieve and nobody is doing anything about it. And meanwhile, as I've, I've read in the press and the media, they're moving people back into those zones, right? Yes, the, the deal there, it's really sad. Uh, let me just finish up one thing on this water okay, into please. the Pacific. Yes. The people on the west coast of the United States have a reason to be worried. It's not being monitored. You know, you've got every river that comes out of the mountains of Japan has been dumping radioactivity into the Pacific. Mm -hmm. But so, um, to, uh, to get back to, to your question about the... Uh, um, <laughs> About the people the, returning. Oh, about the to people these, returning, yeah. 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 The, um, what the Japanese are doing is the Japanese people don't want to return to their homes, especially since the standard's 20 times higher than it was when they left. But the Japanese government is saying, well, look, we've subsidized you to go for four years, and we've been paying you, you know, thousands of dollars a year to live elsewhere. We're going to take your subsidy away, but if you come back, we'll keep paying you. So the people are between a rock and a hard place. You know, there's no place to work, and they've got the uh, they've got the issue of how do they um, how do they live without that stipend? Right. And yet, the, what the Japanese government is doing is telling them go into those highly radioactive areas and live for a while, and we'll continue to pay you. But if you choose to keep your family out, it's over. You don't get any you, you don't get any stipend anymore. It's truly a uh, uh, draconian uh, system. And Arnie, tell us about their their reoperating these nuclear power plants. Since I saw, since I spoke with you the last time here on Nuclear Free Future, they they had not opened up the nuclear power plants in January. But so, since then, what has happened? Well, the um, the Jap Japan had 54 nuclear plants before the uh, the tsunami hit. And of course, the tsunami knocked out four at Fukushima, and actually six at Fukushima. So they're down at 48 that could ever go back online. And then they began to look at their safety concerns, and they said, you know, there's another 20 here that really have never been safe. So out of the 54, they're down at maybe 26 that ultimately may go back online. And um, 
what, what's happening there is that the banks are continuing to fund workers that sit in a power plant for five years and do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and banks don't loan money unless they know they're going to get their money back. And there's been a deal made between the Abe administration, which is the, the prime minister of Japan, and the bank saying, I'm going to start up those 26 power plants come hell or high water. So the first plant just started up um, at Sendai, which is about as far away from Fukushima as you can get. It's actually closer to Korea than it is to Tokyo. <laughs> it's on the southwest side of, of Japan. Um, uh, over protests of three former prime ministers. Uh, think about that. It would be like having you know, George Bush and Bill Clinton and, and uh, Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter yeah. all stand up and say, don't do it, and have the current president do it anyway. Yeah. So three prime ministers said, this is a really bad idea. Uh, let's go with a non-nuclear future. And, uh, and still the Abe regime has, is ramming these down their throat. And the pressure is coming from the banks mm -hmm. on the politicians. They have a thing called the Diet, which is like our like a parliament or like our legislator, uh, like Congress. And the, uh, the pressure that the bankers are putting on the individual uh, politicians in the Diet is astronomical. They want to get these plants running. And Dave Lockbaum, a Union of Concerned Scientists, has said all they did was rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. They didn't make this plant any more robust. All these 26 roughly power plants that will start back up were just reanalyzed to a higher standard. But they didn't make the walls tougher or uh, the pipes stronger. None of that was done. So it's, um, it's frightening. Uh, it should be frightening to the people in Japan. And what is that organization there that is like the NRC here? That they set, the, they supposedly set the standards for the radiation and everything. Yeah, like they that. have a, a national safety agency, um, but it's made up of the same people that regulated Fukushima before the tsunami. You know, the, the regulators have just changed the hat. Um, mm -hmm. They have a different charter. They have a more robust charter, uh, and the commissioners start it as very, very conscientious people. But what's happened there is that the Abe administration has replaced commissioners with pro-nuclear people. So the, the NSA, the, the <coughs> Nuclear Safety Agency, is changing and it's becoming more compliant with what the banks want and what the Abe regime wants. And this, this hormesis, where does that come in as an international kind of a push? Is it, is it only in America, or is, is, this, uh, is this all over? There's been a rogue fraction in the uh, nuclear scientists for a long time. And the, the theory is, uh, the, the correct radiation theory is called LNT, linear no threshold. And uh, radiation, if you get a lot, you're going to die. If you get a little less, maybe you won't die. If you get a little less, maybe you won't die mm -hmm. down to zero. But it's a straight line. Any radiation is going to increase your risk of, of dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what the National Academy of Science says is, is, is how radiation works. It's not good for you. But then there's this group of scientists who say that, uh, no, down at the low end of the spectrum, down, not at the high end, but down, down at the bottom, a little bit of radiation is helpful because your genes mutate and mutating genes are good because it makes you, as a species, uh, superior. <sighs> Truly really frightening. Arnie, this is Lessons from Fukushima that was published back one year after, after Fukushima, the Fukushima meltdown. And you have, uh, it was published by Greenpeace, but you authored a lot in this mm -hmm. too. So what, what do you think about the lessons from Fukushima now? Do you think that uh, people in authority have learned much? Have uh, the, pe the populations in America and in Japan especially have learned a lot because mm -hmm. we've been scrambling to survive all, all of this horrible thing that, that's been going on. But unbeknownst to us, the radiation levels are, are being altered and, and we're told not to worry about things. So. Yeah. What? Well, that report is available on the Fairwind site, and it's also available on the Greenpeace site. Um, and the, the section I wrote was about something called regulatory capture, 
how the regulators in the industry get so cozy that they don't, um, they, they don't really, there's no differentiation. So I could have written that today. Nothing has changed. And this is February 2012. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. Arnie, what is going to happen? You know, you don't have a big tsunami every year and you don't have a big earthquake every year and a mountain doesn't tumble down a hillside every year. Um, so that, um, you know, in theory, uh, we'll go another decade before another big one will hit. The statistics are we've had five meltdowns in 35 years, TMI, Chernobyl, and three at Fukushima over 35 years. So do the math, 35 divided by seven is uh, divided by five is seven. About every decade, we're going to have a big accident. Uh, do we know what it will be? No. Mm -hmm. If we did, we as a society would fix it. But the, the record's clear that something will surprise us, that uh, so, you know, sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. And uh, uh, what it will be and where, we don't know. Uh, one of my biggest fears is a plant in California called Diablo Canyon. Um, Devil's Canyon, it's kind of a frightening term, but it's right on an earthquake fault. And when they built it, they didn't know the earthquake fault was there. So they, um, but after they built it, they discovered it right offshore. And that earthquake fault connects directly into the San Andreas Fault. And the San Andreas Fault connects directly into something called the Cascadia Fault. And the Cascadia Fault is created the biggest earthquake in recorded history. The Native Americans in 1600 talk about a tsunami coming inland by, uh, through Seattle and flooding the Seattle area uh, from uh, a, an earthquake. And records in Japan support that, that there was a huge tsunami in Japan with no earthquake. So we know that this Cascadia Fault created the biggest tsunami that's ever been seen, and, and yet uh, Diablo Canyon continues to run despite that. Mm -hmm. So who is looking out for the public? Well, viewers, we can see that Fairwinds Energy Education is looking out for the public. Arnie Gunderson and Maggie Gunderson have been on this watch for a long time now. And while you say that you could have, this could be published today as it, as it is, but have you found any, any kind of positive response from people and, or governments or, or, po or populace that is listening to you? Well, I think, you know, five years ago, right before the accident, people were, you know, Chernobyl was a long time before that, 20 years before, and people had said, well, we know how to do nuclear now. It's not going to happen again. Right. And what Fukushima showed is that it is going to happen again and will continue to happen again. The, um, the Diet uh, had, a, had a, a study about the accident, and they said it's not an accident. It was a man-made disaster. We, oh, the Japanese uh, Diet. Yes, the Did Japanese they, Diet the, yeah. Yeah, had, a, had its own study. And they, they don't call it an accident anymore. They call it a disaster because an accident is like when an owl hits your windshield. You have no control right. over it. There were plenty of records to show that a tsunami would hit. There's plenty of records at uh, the Diablo site to know that an earthquake will hit. When is the question? Will it hit in the next 20 years while the plant's running? I hope not. But you know, in my world, I, I live in this high risk, low probability. And um, these, these high risk accidents are bound to happen sometime. Mm -hmm. So who asks, who's helping out? I think the public's perception of nuclear has fundamentally changed. And the press's perception of nuclear has fundamentally changed. The, the politicians are still getting their, the, you know, their campaign contributions from the nuclear companies, so they're not changing. But, um, and the money has changed. In the last five years, solar has plummeted. The cost of a solar array has plummeted. And the uh, cost of a nuclear plant has increased. So we're seeing nuclear plants shut down now. And the press understands that it's not economical and it's not safe. Right. Well, that, that is very positive, Arnie. And uh, I think that we can close our, our brief conversation on, on that more positive note and uh, look forward to a nuclear-free future. <laughs> well, thank you. I think 
economics is going to push it for new nukes. I don't think we'll see many new nukes being built because they're just so expensive. And the old nukes are no longer, are, are no longer cheap either. So it's going to be money that shuts them down. Yeah. At the same time, though, from this, this brief conversation, it is very alarming about the relaxation of standards from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and how that impacts the population right here in the state of Vermont regarding Vermont Yankee because a lot of us thought that we were we had great relief when Vermont Yankee closed but but the uh, the impact is still very very strong yeah who's watching this store thank you Arnie okay thanks Margaret. come back again okay thank you viewers goodbye for now